So that's just for those who cannot attend this live session today. So um, again, as we are now uh, 60 people in the Zoom space and still people pouring in, um, a very warm welcome on behalf of both Commonland and Presidency Institute on this event uh, called From Tree Planting to Systemic Change. Um, but also really actually we are speaking about something that we have started to call spaces of belonging or creating spaces of belonging. So that will be our focus of today, uh, creating spaces of belonging. And with today's event, we are also uh, making public a thought process um, that we've put together in a thought paper that we call creating spaces of belonging. And this piece of text is a living document that's describing the ongoing collaboration between Commonland and President Institute to uh, discover what, um, what becomes possible when we work with the four returns framework and theory U um, on landscape restoration partnerships. And there's so much that we've learned over the last couple of years um, that have been that has been brought together into this document. And we believe there's so much more to learn on this uh, continued path as we are scaling up our work, both as Commonland and as Brensling Institute, engaging in, with a much wider variety of stakeholders and across different landscapes, ecosystems, biomes, different cultures, um, and in the urgency of today's time with a convergence of global crises, um, it is so imminent that a, a new approach is needed, uh, a new way of collaborating, holistic approaches, um, new ways of partnerships, coalitions of the willing, um, and a trust building that's required to bridge divides and um, yeah, to find one another uh, in the middle and to find a way to move into these challenges together. So those are the themes we will be touching on today. Um, and I see we are now uh, just over 70. So welcome for those that have just joined us. We're still coming into the space. Um, we'll be spending some time today uh, in dialogue with one another. Um, we'll start with that in a, in a couple of minutes. We'll also be spending some time today listening um, to uh, a few of the people that have been uh, very core to uh, putting these words on paper. So um, my colleague Dieter and Maike um, and myself have been working over the last year to put these words onto paper, uh, but it wouldn't have been without the wisdom and guidance and input uh, of some of the many great people that we work with. Um, so some of these um, guests will be here today and I'll introduce them a little bit uh, more in detail later. Um, but today we'll also hear from Willem Verweda, the founder and um, um, currently our CEO uh, of Commonland. We'll also hear from Katie Stubley, um, we're very much involved with both the Presencing Institute and uh, some of our partnerships in Western Australia. We'll hear from Martin Kalunga Banda, who is very involved with both Presencing Institute's work as well as uh, a new partnership on the African continent. And we'll also hear from Dieter, um, my dear colleague, on the power of the Four Returns Labs uh, and the integration of Four Returns and Theory. So they'll join us later, um, but uh, we're going to start with everyone that is here. So just in a couple of minutes, as people are still pouring in, um, I'm going to hand over to my very dear colleague, Florentina Barsertari from President Institute. Um, it's always lovely to co-host a session with her, um, and she'll guide us into a first breakout session, uh, just to kind of land and arrive in the space. And before we do that, uh, I would just like to ask you to notice how you're arriving here. Are you sitting on a chair? Might be walking in a park? Uh, and just notice how your body is also present in this session. So just bring your attention to your feet and they touch in the ground, either sitting or standing or walking. Just bring the attention to your body, how it's also present here, even though we are only connecting through a screen. There's full bodies connected to us. And just bring your attention to your breath. There's a deep breath in. And out. 
as we are 74 people here in this room today at this moment. We may not see everyone immediately, but we are one community moving through these next two hours together. So with that, again, a very warm welcome. And um, Florentina, over to you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's really lovely to, to see you all. And actually, I will ask you if you'd like that right now I'm seeing myself and Pete, which is extremely uncomfortable. So I usually like to go into gallery view. So you in top of your screen on the right, it's written view, and then you can shift on the gallery. So we can actually have this feeling of being, you know, not just looking at us too, but we are actually a much bigger crowd and you can really, you know, get to see who is who is here. And so with that, I also will welcome everyone if, if you can, I know it's not always possible, but if you can, to put actually your video on, because we're going to actually send you now into a 15 minute uh, breakout group where you'll get to just connect uh, with a few other people because we're really uh, here for that as well and to to hear your questions and a little bit about why you are here as well and so the video makes obviously another kind of uh, visual uh, connection and also a sense of uh, belonging obviously so uh, the two questions uh, that uh, we are asking you, as I said, is just a little bit about why are you here for and what are you curious to learn more about? So I'm going to post that into the chat now. And maybe just a couple of rules. Make sure that like you're going to find yourself with three to four people in the room. It's always nice to just kind of listen to each other and make sure that everyone speaks once, as we say, before someone gets to speak uh, twice. So enjoy uh, the conversations and we will be back here in uh, 15 minutes. Ooh. Closing rooms now, they have 60 seconds. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. We are still waiting a few seconds before everyone join us back here. So we'll be waiting just a little bit more. And so while you're here, what you can do, because right now, for example, I'm guessing you're seeing my face in a big screen. So what you can do is go to the right corner of your screen and put gallery view. Oh, there are even babies with us. Hey, cute. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Welcome, welcome back. I think we have still 25 seconds left into the breakout group. So not everyone is just back yet. So let's wait just another 20 seconds. I'm guessing when you came back into this room, you just saw my face, big screen, yes. So what you can do to not have that happen, <laughs> you can go into the little view button uh, on the right top of your screen and it's written gallery instead of speaker view. Therefore, we can see everyone, which is kind of nicer or personally, I think it's nicer. Uh, so you can do that. And so we can really have a more kind of collective feeling than me talking to you. We're doing that just for like recording purposes, apparently. Uh, okay, I think everyone is back now. So welcome. I hope you had lovely conversation. I actually myself was with uh, 
two lovely people, Antje and Cristal. Thank you for the conversation. So we're going to ask uh, you now to just maybe write a little bit in the chat if there is anything that came up in your conversation in regard to those uh, two questions, just like, what are you here for? And uh, do you have any questions for us that could also a little bit, you know, um, tell us more about uh, the conversation we're going to have afterwards, right? So, so that can also help us uh, direct a little bit uh, the flow of the conversation after. So if you want to write that into the chat, but also if you're bold, you can also raise your hand and I will be taking a few uh, voices. So if you wish to just speak, please raise your hand, not like physically raise your hand because I cannot see everyone at the same time, but there is a reaction button at the bottom of your screen. Some of you might know this already. It's written reactions. You click on there and it's written raise hand. Therefore, I will see you and then I can call on you. We will only have like about, I think we have now eight minutes or so left. And so I will just... Uh, uh, take three or four voices, but you can also read obviously into the chat, you know, what is uh, coming to you. So who would like also to share live? Don't be too shy. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Da Sanchez, right? Yeah, that's me. There you go. Welcome. Welcome. Nice to see you all. I just woke up. English is my second language, so I will try to do the best. <laughs> I am calling from Peru right now, 7 a.m. And I was, I appear because I was late in the room with Tom and John. And it was like really nice because they were, they already like started doing like the chicken and I kind of like really connect with all of like by listening to both of them on one side, we were like trying like to understand about like our roots to our to our place to one place and how people that are traveling a lot they don't have like they can they kind of root in that way that mm -hmm. that was a point of view and for me it was like really interesting because i have been traveling for almost two years <laughs> so i was like i hear you <laughs> in that part and then also we talk about like the origin how to connect like with the spaces um yeah in that uh, yeah we talk about that in and that was that was like really interesting and to see like how the three of us we arrived to the workshop and for me i really liked like the title of the workshop i gotta say like it caught my attention the narrative about the trees and source of change and yeah it was like really interesting like to see the different point of views of why we are gathering here today. Mm. Thank you. Thanks for sharing and opening the floor. Anyone else would like to share? Is there like questions that you have or any reasoning while you have joined this conversation today? I think Ronnie Duncan wants to share things. Ah, I don't. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, hi, Ronnie. Hello. Hi there. Hi, hi there. <laughs> hi. Uh, it was a lovely uh, conversation we just had, and um, I'm struck by a comment that uh, one of the colleagues meant, uh, said, uh, Lady uh, Prima from Indonesia was talking about um, rice cultivation and how really it takes three seasons before the fields are decontaminated from chemical um, and this period of time where the, the farmers have to really have faith um, and uh, and uh, please the please the goddess and and uh, feel that they're they're blessed and the question that's sitting with me when i listen to that is we may have the same although with a different focus um, and how do we help people manage time and timing um, in a mindset when we're trying to transition from, say, an industrial method where everything happens in a sequence where we're trying to manage things 
in a constellation. So I'm interested in patience and the quality of holding people um, that may be more to do with faith and hope than it is to do with chemicals. Beautiful. Thanks, Ronnie. And nice to see you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who else? I think I'm just checking also that I'm still on time. Yes, another minute to maybe hear one voice. I read in the chat how to trigger systemic change, Sylvie. I loved our conversation about the connection to the forest, the healing force of nature and trees in particular. I'd love to further explore the connection between the social field and the fields in nature, also about the use of permaculture for gardens and humans. Hey, Giuseppe, go ahead. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, so I was in the room with uh, Christine, Ilona, and Arik, I believe. I hope I'm not butchering any of their names. Um, <laughs> uh we talked about well uh we were uh the reasons each of us were here and um there was something that christine said that was very uh interesting towards the end that she said uh that it's important that we think about how to design these regenerative systems but uh how was it again uh that you have to take care that it um actually affects change because uh, the regenerative system can't just be, you know, like just planting trees and then we're done. You have to have some uh, form of participation and actual sustainability. And I thought that that was very thought provoking. Um, I myself am a, a student. I, uh, I was talking to them how I wrote this article about uh, the Great Green Wall in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and how that was... Um, important towards uh, developing future Pan-African institutions. Uh, I was a international relations student. I graduated this year. And um, it was very interesting to hear her say that because uh, this is the particular mission that the Great Green Wall has, right? Uh, it's not just planting trees to stop the, the, the advance of the Sahara Desert. It's also about promoting citizenship and uh, participation in politics. And it's very important that we have this notion in mind because this is what affects uh, institutions and systemic change. Uh, it's pretty much the title of this presentation as well. It's not just planting trees. We want to affect systemic change. And to reach that, we have to have a uh, global political participation, right? Um, so what Christine said really resonated with me uh, on that point. And I think that this is very, <clears throat> sorry, um, I think this is very important uh, for us all to have in mind uh, when we are designing these uh, regenerative systems that we keep in mind, how is this going to get the community to participate? How is this going to get the community to actively think about the politics? Because uh, whether we like it or not, when we talk about food and when we talk about, uh, well, preservation, we are talking about politics and very important politics at that. So when we think about getting something that actually changes the world, we have to think to engage communities, to engage our local community and also the international community. Uh, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe, and congratulations for your graduation, therefore, as well. Uh, I think it's a great segue, uh, actually, into our next uh, bit. We're gonna hear from our guest speaker now, but I will let uh, Peter uh, introduce them. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Florentina, and also thanks to the, uh, um, the people who shared their contributions, both in the chat and also uh, um, by voice. And I really liked what you said, Giuseppe, around um, you know, going to the mind and the thoughts, um, because one of the uh, pieces we'll speak about and also that uh, the document the thought paper speaks about is that um, you know whether we are planting trees or restoring land in another way it's the thoughts that inform those actions um, and often there is a lot of convincing involved uh, in certain actions um, but what if the mindset was different from which certain actions originate so if the mindset um, uh, is different, then maybe the action tree planting becomes the obvious choice rather than cutting trees down. 
so this level of mindsets or sort of the um, the space from which humans uh, operate or the paradigm that we live in, um, that seems to be sort of underneath a lot of the um, problems that appear at the surface. Uh, so how do we go down to these deeper layers and how do we engage the community also in a dialogue um, around those questions and the values that we share? Um, and those questions are really at the beginning um, of this thought paper. Um, and yeah, we'd like to introduce our guest speakers to help us be in dialogue around uh, some of the things we've learned uh, and are still exploring. So I'd just like to welcome uh, with me here um, our guest speakers. Uh, so Katie Stubley is um, a dear friend of mine. We've known each other for a long time. And um, she's working with the Brenzing Institute already for many years, as well as with the Commonlands Landscape Partners in Western Australia. So welcome, Katie. Um, then next uh, is my dear colleague, Dieter. Uh, we also know each other for quite some time from uh, his time in South Africa originally, uh, but now uh, with me at Commonland, um, working on yeah, really bringing this, this notion of forward returns labs based on theory U forward. Um, and what it means to bring people together into a common space um, to restore landscapes together. So welcome, Dieter. Um, next, uh, I would like to invite Willem. Um, Willem is uh, the founder of Common Land. Uh, and if it wasn't for Willem's entrepreneurial energy to launch this organization with the bold ambitions that it has, uh, we wouldn't be doing here this work. Um, so it's something about connecting to that vision uh, and then drawing people um, with that vision and compelling them into action um, that's allowing us to step up. So thanks, Willem, and thanks for joining us. Um, and lastly, I'd like to invite Martin. Um, Martin is a dear friend of many of ours. Uh, he's been working in uh, the continent of Africa for many years and also involved with Brenzing Institute, uh, both with a program called Ubuntu Labs, um, which is now also connecting with the many landscape restoration opportunities. Um, there we go, there's also Martin popping up in the screen. So welcome uh, all four of you. Um, we'll be, hi Martin, welcome. So we'll be in dialogue together around a couple of questions. Um, you've worked with us over the last uh, couple of years and also more recently on putting these thoughts onto paper for the document creating spaces of belonging. Um, and in that process, um, yeah, we've engaged in, in trying to put words to something that we believe has a big potential. Um, so we'd like to put just two questions to most of you, and I'll start with you, Katie. Um, after having read the document and all of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years, could you tell us what is a space of belonging to you? Thanks, Peter. Um, and um, it's an honor to start. So I think I love this topic, you know, spaces of belonging. Um, and even as you were introducing people, you use this term, dear friend. Um, and I think that that's what this community creates. Um, it's, you know, beyond colleagues, it's, it's friendship, it's um, connection, um, and the possibility for us to create something deeper out of this, this connection. So I think what I'm noticing a lot of today is that actually so much, so many people are displaced. Um, so we have a lot of people who actually don't know where their place is in the world. We might be, you know, um, it might be from our generation or it might be from generations back. So how do we actually find these places of belonging um, and what actually connects us when actually many of us will feel like, you know, who, whose land am I on? What's my connection? Do I know this place? So what I love about Theory U is it asks the question, um, what's the future actually asking from us? So this is a space that we can actually connect into. So every human being belongs to the planet and every human being actually belongs and is connected to the future. So here we are sitting here um, and by connecting into the future that wants to emerge, we actually find our place of belonging. We find our people, we find our way to connect into place. Um, so as I was reading this, this, um, uh, this, you know, paper on spaces of belonging, 
it wasn't just, you know, here, here's something for all the people in the world who want to belong to a future that we're really passionate about, but also um, this language of the four returns is something that every human being can understand. We know that when we look at a healthy landscape that we see inspiration, we see social capital, we see, you know, environmental health. Um, and we see that the, the economics and the finance run in a way that support these four things. So I think I saw this, um, yeah, so in reading this document, I saw everything that could help us as human beings actually belong together again and have a shared language and a shared process to do this. Thanks so much, Katie, for these words. And I love how you have been bringing in the future. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to just move over to Willem. Um, because Willem, um, with starting Common Land, somehow tapped into a certain future that allowed a lot of work to happen. Um, so I'm curious uh, if you could say something, Willem, what it meant for you to create a space of belonging for people uh, around the theme of landscape restoration. Thank you, Peter, and uh, also thank you, Katie, and lovely to to be here and to see all those uh, those people uh, joining up in this this uh, this meeting. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, for me, I think it, it all started very early as a kid. Um, uh, uh, I think that the space of belonging for me is, is about to feel accepted and connected by the place where you are, and especially by the nature of all these other beings, other species. In my, in my case, it was a snake that wake me up when I was eight years old. Just to t and, and that snake told me when I s encountered that snake in nature, that, that she and I were part of a bigger system and a bigger place. And we were actually united to each other. And never, that, that feeling never left me. So when, when I grew up and, and started studying biology and learned all these things about the nature and nature conservation and had been working in that field for many years, um, my, my dream was, or my, my feeling was, why, can, can I, why can't we work, find that space of belonging on this planet with all those other people and, and find a common narrative to, to, to work with nature and to be part of nature in a way and to create businesses that are uh, enabling nature and ecosystems and whatever. Uh, yeah, to create that future and to build upon the future that we need for our, uh, our kids and, and next generations. And uh, so for me, spaces of belonging is not always associated to a place it is of course because i'm i also have a garden and a place where i would like to stay and, and relax or a nature area uh, or or an agricultural field but it is much more it is about uh, creating a space that unites us unite us with all those other species and take the responsibility or the stewardship to work together to to uh, to maintain this place and and to grow this place in a, in a in a nice uh, in a nice next yeah uh, uh, yeah next phase uh, and that's why I, I i dedicated my time to uh, as katie said towards uh, a, a, a narrative a language that everyone can understand and can associate it to and that is also practical to let you to work on these things and and that's how the four returns uh, came uh, into existence Thank you. Thanks, Willem. So there's a couple of elements already coming to the surface around a shared language, um, connecting with the future and connected to place. Um, so I'd like to move over to Martin and um, just curious, you know, having um, come from one place in the world and now working from another place um, and then offering a space of dialogue uh, for different African nations to come together. Uh, and in that you recently shared that there's a longing to connect with the soil and the African soils. Um, so in the context of your current work, I'm curious what a space of belonging is for you, Martin. Thanks, Peter. Um, for me, this is like return to reality. The work that we do in the Presencing Institute extended to the work that we do in Ubuntu Lab Institute, which is a regional school of the Presencing Institute, reminded me, reconnected me with the deeper philosophy in which I was born and I grew up. 
on the continent of Africa from Cape to Cairo, from Sierra Leone to Djibouti, there is the equivalent of Ubuntu. Ubuntu, in my narrow understanding, simply meant I am because you are. My well-being is so intimately intertwined with your well-being that even the thought of thinking about you being separate from me is irrelevant. But this work allowed me to learn a layer deeper when I began to understand that in the statement, I am because you are, my well-being is inseparable from your well-being, that you and your did not just mean Katie and Peter and Dita and other people. Actually, in the text or in the statement, your well-being is inseparable from your, my well-being. It included the following. It included my ancestors, those that have walked the earth before I arrived here. And that in our traditions, they are the living dead. They never cease being. But then I also learned that your well-being is inseparable from my well-being, includes those that will call me or will call us their ancestors. And at the same time, I was reminded that your well-being includes the soil, includes Mother Earth. If the soil is not well, I cannot be well. It was then that I realized the African approach to systems thinking. It is the ancestors that have gone. Those that will call me their ancestor. You and I, but also it includes Mother Earth. When we make connections that way, and in the work that we have been doing with Common Land, you do not just understand that mentally. You begin to feel it down your spine. You begin to feel it in your bones. These connections we are talking about, they are not just intellectual. It's visceral. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Martin. Um, so we've touched on the future uh, with Katie and, uh, and the kinships and friendships among us. And we've touched on uh, how meetings with animals um, can put us on a certain path to create a language that can transcend um, different languages and find a sort of unified voice to navigate this complexity. And we've connected with our ancestors who um, you've so beautifully said are with us today um, and, and allow us to remember uh, to connect uh, with Mother Earth. So having heard all of this, Dieter, uh, and knowing that you've worked um, with me over the last uh, year and with Micah as well on putting words onto paper, um, also in a way that these sort of themes and questions can land concretely uh, into a space of, okay, so what, what do we do now? Um, how do we create uh, these kinds of spaces? I'm curious if you could speak to um, what a space of belonging is for you um, and how what you're learning around creating these kinds of spaces. Thanks, Peter. And thanks, Katie and Willem and Martin for your, your words. It's difficult to speak after three people who've been my mentor of, of the last four, five, six years to do the work I'm doing. Or mentor is always both ways. Well, I learned a lot together with them. So thanks for that. Um, so, one, I want to just almost repeat the words that will already be said, because that's for me the spaces of belonging as well. I think for me to add to, to that spaces of belonging was when we wrote the document was a little bit as well to look at. So on the one side, there is this world we're looking at. And when we look at the news around climate change, loss of biodiversity, the war in Ukraine, it's it's a poor world out there. It's like 
some there is a big urgency and when you really dive into that it's not a space you want to wake up in and definitely like me i'm going to get a child in two weeks six weeks i want a different world my child grows up in the other side i i feel really privileged uh, 15 years to start my own ngo but working with common land and and with the presencing institute and been traveling the world to see that there are so many amazing people who are doing their work, W work, the big work, what they're doing to change this world are among us. And when you look at them and you really start looking at that potential, all the solutions we need to solve those big problems are already out there. The challenge that I see is that they are still really small working by themselves and don't really have a space of belonging to come together to learn with each other and build a common and common narrative together to create a different narrative than the narrative we see on the on the television together. So for me, really, when you talk at around space of belonging, is create a safe space where people can support each other to do the big W work and to support each other through the harsh times we have, connecting with the urgency and the challenges we're facing but holding each other in compassion that we, and in a space of return of inspiration that we can support each other to keep doing that work. Um, and I think Otto always says leading from the emerging future, that the, the future is already there. Like when we now choose as human beings that there is a better future out there, that will be our future because everything is there for us. And not only on the ground, but there is more and more awareness in our communities in higher up that the change needs to happen eh? with all the agreements. There is a lot of money wants to get in. So how can we create these spaces that people can come together uh, with compassion? I think that's for me uh, uh, important for compassion and trust. So that's me, Peter, thank you. Thanks, Dieter. And I know that the word trust also has an important place within the document. Um, so as we'll be sending it out later, um, people will also find that back in there. So thanks for these words. Uh, and thanks for uh, all four of you to kick us off into this dialogue. Um, the title of this event, From Tree Planting to Systemic Change, um, also puts in place a certain way of looking at these urgencies that you're also describing, Dieter. Um, but it's important to stand still um, with the notion why that is important. Uh, and knowing that Common Land is in the process of becoming a systems change organization, uh, and there's so much to learn, and there's so many ambitions to try and really catalyze uh, the, larger, uh, the larger ambitions uh, that we have. Um, I'd like to put the question to you, Willem, um, you know, in, in Common Land now growing and learning towards this, um, why is it important to create spaces of belonging in the context of systems change, or even why is the systemic change so urgent now? Yeah, thank you, Peter. Yeah, I mean, actually, we all we we all see those crises, huh? and, and uh, I think for us, the biodiversity crisis is the most important one. But you have the climate crisis, the energy crisis, the food crisis, you name it. But above the this all there is the, the what i call the purpose crisis the consciousness crisis and this consciousness crisis is very much associated to uh, the biodiversity loss crisis the, the thing that really goes deep into our heart and um one of our colleagues um, uh, is is uh, an aboriginal uh, leader from west australia he i think he really framed it very well he said biodiversity is the manifestation of the spirit so we are in a, in a in a spiritual consciousness crisis and 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 so it's much more about purpose where are we going and and can we heal ourselves through healing let's say ecology and the world outside of us uh, not only the relationship between people but also the relationship with us in ourselves and the relationship between our, our you know our native uh, homo sapiens uh, but also our other the other species and the ecosystem that surrounds us and and uh, from a technical and scientific point of view uh, I'm, I'm also an ecologist i have an eco ecosystem background it is not difficult to restore ecosystems we know how it works but there are some conditions it takes time so we need to be patient uh, we need to go back to where we come from that is the land the soil the forest the wetlands and so on uh, of course, we need the technology to do all those things. So, so 
from a system perspective, we system change is 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 starts with open open mind and the consciousness, and that is why the theory you and the presencing institute and the work you do is so important. And meanwhile, it, we know how to do it. We know we know at the land how how to make those changes. And and we started coming into to let's say to make system change practical. And that's why we need to build it up. We need we need to cut it down into 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 some blocks. We've called it the four returns of impact, the five process elements, which you know, and the theory use is essential to make that happen. Uh, you know, work with people to create a common purpose on the land and with them among themselves. You know, open mind also to business and finance and 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 those other worlds that that have created a degradation system over the last two three hundred years. Uh, and we all we all are part of that, but but we are now able to change that, and we are able to make system change practical. And um, what our ambition is from uh, from from Commonland and from the people we work with and all those other organizations that are in this this uh, in this um, in this field now on on ecosystem or landscape restoration uh, or, and 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 conservation, is to create a narrative that is so powerful that we can build this economic can rebuild this economic system into a regenerative economic system where we bring you know our soul and heart into the system um and make sure that they can do with we can do the right thing with our hands while using our head and um and yeah that that's the momentum where we are now living in and i'm pretty optimistic about that that change will work and will come and then we will enter uh, as i call it the age of ecology Thanks, Willem, and thanks for also um, bringing in these other words uh, around spirit and purpose um, and also soul. Uh, we've moved on from soil uh, to the level of soul um, and also on um, making things also practical and connecting them um, with technologies and uh, with pragmatic approaches. Um, and I'd like to just zoom into one of the landscapes where we have been putting this integration of the four returns and theory you into practice. Um, so I'd like to put a question again around this to you, Katie. Um, having worked with us over the last couple of years in Western Australia, with the various attempts to scale up regenerative agriculture and developing the business models around that, but also this question of, of colonization and um, yeah, the indigenous communities on that land there, um, I'm sure there's so much that you have learned uh, around creating systems change on that side of the continent. Um, we won't have time to go into all of it, uh, but I'd just love to ask you, um, yeah, what have you learned around creating systems change or spaces of belonging towards systems change in Western Australia? Um, there we go, the right button. Um, I think, uh, I mean, we've learned so many things. You're right, Peter, it's a, it's a big question. And at the heart of it, they're all the things that I think when I tell you that they're, they're all the things that you know. Um, they're all the most simple things and yet they feel like the hardest things to actually make happen. So, um, so I think, you know, as we all know, it's that deep listening capacity um, and when we're not deeply listening um, to each other, we, we don't see the whole. So as Willem said, and I, I love so many things that you said, but this, this crisis of consciousness, um, you know, in the theory of you language, we always say, if, if you want to shift consciousness, you need to be able to see and sense the system. So what we noticed in Western Australia is often we were bringing the same stakeholders together. So we could still only see and sense parts of the systems together. So actually by extending that out and being willing to actually see our land landscape in new ways um, and listening into what our land wanted. So it's not only listening to each other, but listening to our landscape, it made a powerful, powerful difference. What we saw is when it comes to land, um, there's, there's so much fear. So land is our survival, it's our real estate, it's our everything. Um, and as we know around the world, um, uh, when, we, when we don't feel at home, you know, so much gets threatened in that. So I think to be able to sit together and be vulnerable together was one of the biggest things we needed to cultivate. 
So as someone said, um, we were sort of digesting, how do you create a safe space? And if you show up with all the answers, we're not, own, we're not going to create a safe space. So actually by showing up in our landscape and saying, this is what I do not know. Am I brave enough to come here and say, these are the parts that I don't know, I have no idea. Um, can we bring what we don't know together and actually use that as our starting place? Um, so I think they were really big pieces of it. And at the same time, when the more you begin to see and sense in the system, it's really confronting because we haven't treated our land well. We often haven't treated the people whose land we're on uh, well either. And so the guilt, the shame, these emotions actually often make us want to run away. So how do we stay present and how do we not give our own humanity up and how do we not sort of recreate these colonizing patterns just by re reversing the power balance either. So I think this is a moment that really deeply invites us to be human together, to be vulnerable together, to constantly listen, um, but at the same time to always be listening into that future that connects us. Thanks so much, Katie, for these words. Um, and just uh, noticing that we have over 100 people also still here with us. Um, we know that you're all still here uh, and attentively listening. Uh, just to let you know, in, um, in about 10 minutes, we'll open up um, into breakout rooms to sort of digest with, with one another everything that's being shared. Um, so just to, so you know what's coming. But I'd like to um, sort of take everything you shared, uh, Katie, around deep listening and um, arriving into a safe space to be vulnerable with one another um, as you know, something that uh, seems to be worthwhile, yet so hard to achieve if there's guilt and shame in the way, right? Like if those are the barriers to actually move into that vulnerability, especially if there is a certain esteem or power at place, um, how do we you know, allow to go through those barriers? Um, and uh, that's a question for you, Martin, knowing that you've worked with state leaders and, and actors at various levels, um, what have you learned around um, moving through or transforming guilt and shame and power to arrive at a space of vulnerability? Great question, Peter. There is some sense in which I think power, the ability to make things happen, is unnatural up to a certain level to be held by one office or one person. When I have had the chance to either serve a head of state or be near enough someone who runs this thing called country, you can immediately see how unnatural it is for one human being to wield such power. It's almost like as soon as you step there, and it doesn't know any region. I saw it in Africa. I have seen it in Europe. When one person wields such levels of power and they are not educated enough on how to dance with such powers, then the power consumes them. This is true whether we are talking about the public sector or the private sector. But when the occupant of this position of power is educated enough and they see themselves as the custodian of what Willem talked about earlier on, the spirit of the system, then they work and dance with that power to do good. They dance with that power to listen to what the land is saying, to what the inhabitants of the land are saying. Should they lose sight of that power, whether in private sector or business sector, it is like a drug. You enjoy it for the first few hours, then it takes over and it's not you thereafter showing up. It is the drugged you. This is 
not just about one region, one race. Even in the little organizations we create, I am part of Ubuntu Lab Institute, a vision, the regional vision of Presencing Institute. My colleagues, if I am not careful, can tend to treat me and put me on a pedestal because I was just part of the starting group. That's the way society goes. It ascribes authority and power, depending on who you are in the system. But if you happen to be the occupant, remember what William said. Look for the spirit with which this thing was created and constantly find yourself a way to nourish yourself with that spirit because that is what makes humility as natural as breathing. I am not the, I am an instrument of. When a leader, when an initiator, when an innovator, when a teacher understands that, they then become an instrument of helping to realize whatever spirit was behind the creation, the coming into being of an institution, of an organization, of a community. Once you start embracing and enjoying the pedestal that these positions self-created or ascribed give, that's the moment you realize you are gone and fast irrelevant to the situation. A long winding way of simply saying we humans might not be capable of holding power in the manner we think it should be held. Thank you, Martin. Um, and what resonated with me now so strongly is um, how humility uh, can become our nature by reconnecting to that spirit. Um, and I recognize also in that a way in which Dieter uh, has been an instrument also in giving shape to integrating, I guess, the spirit uh, or that source that has brought to life the four returns um, with the spirit that was the source of the Ryu. Um, and yeah, Dieter, I see you've been trying to find shapes and forms to um, something that is inspiring you uh, and around this spirit of potential. Um, and I guess my question to you is, you know, in that, in that dance movement around then the humility that Martin was speaking about, uh, but also standing for something that you believe in. Um, what have you learned in, in, uh, yeah, in that light also around um, creating these kinds of shapes, such as four returns labs uh, in different landscapes um, for yourself in terms of your own humility um, and in, in offering these kinds of uh, spaces to others? Thanks, Pete. And uh, again, uh, a, a lot of other wisdoms that came around, and I really liked it how you summarize it. Um, I think for me, there, there were two things. One thing in my life, when, what happened when I was 10 years old, reading the book Gorilla in the Mist. And on the one side, as a 10 year old, being so in a way of reading about gorillas and falling in love with nature and just like, yeah, that's me. Like that gorilla is as much me and, and the same experience Willem had with the snake. But on the other side, I read in that book as well, how people were poaching those gorillas for ashtrays. And I still do today know that I can't, I couldn't believe it. And my dad came to me and said, why are you crying? And he said, okay, Dieter, don't worry, there are bad people on this world. And till today, I don't believe that people grow, grow up uh, thinking, oh, let me make my job to go and kill, kill a gorilla or, or hurt himself or others on, on nature. I really believe we're creating systems that are putting people into places they don't want to be in. And so that was always a drive for me to, to, to find that and find systems and find new places that people could come into a better space that they don't need to do that. And when I started the NGO Living Lands in South Africa, I, I was a young student, didn't really know what I, want, was, what I was doing, but I was really enthusiastic and inspired to make a change I thought that was needed. 
And I really remember when we started the project in the Bavarian Clove, I was, okay, great, I know what to do. The farmers are degrading their land. Uh, I have the solution. I need to do research to convince those farmers how to solve it. And still with the kind of mindset unconsciously that the farmers are, were doing something wrong and I need to correct them. So we started and the farmers were not engaging with us, not listening to us, not trusting us, not believing our solution. Till I read the quote, I read the book Presence and the quote, the success of the intervention depends on the interior state of the intervener. It really connected me back to that moment of my dad and I was, wait a minute, when I can imprint in myself and keep imprinting, I get emotional about it is, Every human being across me is not doing that because it's his will doing that because it's a system pushing him to do that. And what can I help that person to get into that better space? That keeps me going. That every morning it keeps me going. It's hard because sometimes people hurt you. Sometimes people hurt the system or sometimes people hurt other animals. Uh, you hear farmers talking about how they manage their land and you know that's not the right way. But when you can stay connected to that, that better side of that human, there is a way to keep energized. And I think that's my biggest, uh, biggest driver in that is, and I think that makes a four return special. Yes, it is a return of financial capital, natural capital, social capital, but that deep return of inspiration and hope for me, that's that's the driver when we can make, can reconnect people to their potential and to their bigger capital. What I said before, that's driving me to wake up every morning because and I'm being really fortunate and privileged to work with a lot of people who have been holding me my high potential. Hey, meeting uh, Martin or meeting Otto for a while or you, Peter or Katie. I always feel people look at me in my biggest potential, so that drives me there as well. And I think that's, I think, what we need, really need. Like, yeah, that's a little bit my answer to your question, Peter. Thanks so much, Dieter. And also thanks for going to that, to that story in your life that I see as a biographical moment uh, where you connected to your source and your spirit uh, to bring this work, uh, the book that you've read and uh, the actions that you've taken. So as much as it is about uh, the systems change. It's also about who we are as people and, you know, the biographies that we are in um, and how we connect within ourselves to our own, um, I guess, um, paradigms or mindsets that allow us to shift both ourselves and the system beyond us. Um, and just trying to find a way to close, you know, everything that's been said uh, and trying to create space for all of the other voices that are here. Um, I'd love to just end with, with you, Willem, because there's you know, in the four returns, um, there's the natural capital, the social capital, um, and the financial capital. Um, and people connect with that and say, yeah, that makes sense. We've heard those kinds of concepts before. But then there's that fourth one. There's the return of inspiration. Um, and there's something about that one that, uh, that, that makes people's eyes lit up. Um, you know, when we talk about the work at Common Land, uh, the first three is like, yeah, yeah, we know those. But then the return of inspiration, and you see just people's eyes just like, give a little shimmer. Um, so I guess maybe as a final question towards you um, in moving forward um, from your source and your spirit um, and that sense of inspiration, um, you know, with all of the different approaches that we're now taking and uh, working in more landscapes with more diverse stakeholders and, and different ecosystems um, and also offering um, more and more of these so-called four returns labs as a space of belonging and also as a space to uh, to speak that shared language and to um, to bring that inspiration. Um, I guess my question to you at this point is, um, what is what is the kind of inspiration that you would love to cultivate? Um, that um, or the sort of the inspiration that you believe people can can find in such a space of belonging, um, or how you um, how you see that return of inspiration fueling all of us uh, to bridge these divides and, and and connect with this work and with our own deeper purpose. So I know it's a big question. I'm putting you a bit on the spot. Um, but um, yeah, inviting you to speak uh, from your heart on yeah your own inspiration um, and um, what what could be possible for all of us. 
Whew, wow, uh, that's a that's a, a big question. Uh, th thank you for bringing uh, for, for bringing it up. Uh, I was not prepared, uh, but let me let me try. Um, yeah, it it is it is true. What I did with the Fortin framework actually is bringing, let's say, the usual things from the, com the conservation and the restoration community uh, into a new, uh, uh, yeah, into a new system, new wording, and and bringing the theory U wording and also, uh, yeah, what we have just discussed, opening up the heart, uh, bringing the purpose back into the work, uh, in this this super important work that we need to do into a, a, a narrative and approach uh, with a whole structure behind it, with monitoring evaluation and everything that is needed to, at the end, to come to a, yeah, what I call an ecosystem or landscape asset class in the world of finance. But mind you, those finance people of, of, of GP Morgan, of the BlackRock, of the pension funds are normal people. They're people like us. Um, and so they have a heart as we all have a heart. And if you want to open up this, this new way of working, you need to start with bringing back the purpose. And I've called it return of inspiration. Why? Because it fits into ROI, which is normally in their world, it's the return on investment. So if you start with ROI, the return on inspiration, you start with a different conversation. And you start with a conversation about how can we bring back the passion in our work? And how is that passion reflected to our heart and to actually the purpose of why you are here on this planet in this very timely, in this very, very small time frame between your first breath and your last breath? And how can you make, how can you contribute to something? And how can you contribute to the fact that you bring, let's say, the world a little bit further and bring nature back to where it belongs? And that is in the heart as part of our yeah, being a species among those other species. And I've learned uh, that the word return of inspiration helps to build that bridge with that business and finance community, because you can also use it as a bringing down the risks. If you talk to that 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 business community and finance community, they talk about returns and risks. They're, those two words are the only two words that matter. If, and if we want to to system, you know, to change the system, uh, we need first of all we need to show that it works, and that is what we try to do with Commonland and with many organi other organizations. But we want to use a, yeah a narrative that that works and that that can be copied and can be multiplied, and that the same. At the same, on, on the other side, we need to build a bridge and talk about risks and returns in a different way. And the return of, of inspiration is something that people, that everyone matters because everyone will have a different, you know, vision for what inspiration means. For one, for one person, it means the return of spirituality, the return of purpose, return of going back to my kids, the return of, of understanding what nature really means or what my purpose of being here is really means. And for other people, it's it's going back to the essence of their their own religion, whether it's Muslim or Buddhism or Hindu or Christianity. It doesn't matter, and that's why this this word is so powerful because we put it at an, at an at an equal we we put it equal together with the social returns, the, uh, the financial returns, and the biodiversity returns or the natural returns. We put it in an equal frame. That equality, um, in general, is not normal. People don't do this because people in general, especially in the business world, they live a separate and a, a disconnected, they live in a disconnected way. And so this is the way how to connect your own inner nature with the nature outside of you and with your, your friends and community where you, where you take part in. Uh, and then, and then of course, the next step is, and you, you, you didn't mention is of course the zoning approach and all these things that are, are help us to understand what an ecosystem or a landscape is and where to do the right things in the different zones to make it tangible, to, to start doing it. Maybe I should stop here. Thanks so much, Willem. And thanks also for en uh, ending and closing on, on action and doing it. Um, and I think what I take away from all of your words um, as, as many things, uh, the power of soil and soul, uh, through which there was also a lot of resonance in the chat, a lot of people connected to that, um, seeing and sensing the system, um, connecting to purpose and spirit, 
Um, making it also very practical systems change uh, to not get caught up in concepts, but to actually practice and, and go out and do, um, but with a humility um, and to create a space of deep listening that allow us to connect also beyond power and beyond guilt and shame. Um, and that in and of itself is then a nourishing space, allowing us to reconnect to that uh, spirit. Um, and uh, with your words also at the end there, Dieter, um, that what you describe as sort of the mindset from which you find yourself operating, which is all people are good. Um, and because of that, uh, it's not the people that I'm going against, it's the system that I'm trying to change. And I can connect uh, to the other people uh, in trying to do so. And I think that's also for what I take away from your words, Willem, is is it's that um, intention uh, to connect with one another in all of that work, whether it's bankers, investors, or whoever it is, uh, that the intention is to connect with one another and in that connectedness, uh, move towards all of the challenges that we face. So um, I think I'll, I'll put a ribbon around this here for now, uh, knowing that um, uh, we're gonna um, just digest this with, uh, with everyone in small breakout groups. Uh, so I'll just bring back Florentina uh, to help guide us into that space. So thanks to all the speakers and Florentina. Thank you, Peter. And wow, thank you, everyone. Uh, I just feel like uh, actually quite re-inspired and it just kind of reconfirms uh, also all. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, I will invite first everyone because we have been probably sitting and in a really, really focused manner, looking at our screens uh, as well. Uh, so maybe if you want, you don't have to, but just taking a little stretch, you know, however you feel, or if you want to just like stare at something else just for a second, you know, just to kind of, oh, you know, let the dust and all this wisdom settle a little bit and come back to, to your cell, uh, sense of self uh, as well. So uh, in a few seconds, we're going to send you again into a breakout group where you're going to have uh, the chance to exchange a little bit like what kind of came up for you really while you know uh, they were speaking. There is a lot of also wisdom in, in the chat. And thanks for interacting there as well. If you want, I don't know if you know this, but you can also Tag, um, click on the three dots in the chat, which makes you save the chat and you can therefore read it later. Well, it can also be really interesting to see what everyone has uh, written. So we're going to send you in those breakout rooms and the questions that we send you with are what stood out for you um, in this conversation and what questions maybe are, are coming up for you now as well. So what stood out for you and what questions are coming up for you. So we will send you, I believe, for around um, 12 minutes. So enjoy your conversation and see you back here for a QA. Thank So the speakers have not been sent to, uh, to the rooms. So it should okay. be um, just us staying here. Perfect. Thanks. <clears throat> Welcome back. We have another 30 seconds before everyone is back in the room. Hope you had some good uh, conversations. And maybe you can start thinking a little bit about uh, what are some of those questions that in the breakout group really uh, stick with you and that you would like to, to bring up maybe in this space and maybe you would like to write them into the chat here. But also we have an opportunity to really go into a bit of a Q&A with our guest uh, speakers. And so if you have also a question, particularly to someone uh, that you've heard speak uh, today, 
please uh, go ahead and raise your hand and, and, and ask. We're going to have like, yeah, about 15 minutes uh, together. I think everyone is back now. Yeah, I think so. Perfect. So welcome back, everyone. If you have a questions, please, you can also write it into the chat or just raise your hand. And I see that there is Elton that raised uh, his hand. Please go ahead. Thanks. Um, I would like to ask a question to Martin, um, seeing also that uh, yeah, his organization is called Ubuntu. Ubuntu, the way I understand it, is really yeah, it emanates from the African culture uh, of uh, yeah I, of society being above the individual, and yeah, and connecting with um, yeah what he said about uh, yeah leaders really yeah being yeah being able to uh, that they can achieve they can become an instrument uh, of the aspirations of people if they are able to connect with the spirit and not really being on the pedestal and be the, the know it all and be it all. You know, I have a bit of a conflict in my, in my, in my mind, in my thought process. When I look at uh, the African culture of Ubuntu um, and the practice, what I see uh, where actually power is so much abused yeah, within the same uh, societies, families, uh, and, and, and countries. How, how is it possible that Ubuntu, in a, in a continent of Ubuntu, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we see again, so power being abused in such, a, in such a manner. How do you see that? Elton. We, we didn't expect tough questions when we said questions. It was supposed to be slightly simpler, but... Uh, <laughs> um, yes, we have to relearn what Ubuntu means for the continent and for the globe. For Africa, there is one mitigating factor. The period of slavery and colonialism perpetrated over 402 years is long enough to reshape not only our thinking but our inner core. So we are struggling on the continent to go back to that which we know we are in the face of these 402 years of being moved in a different way. Because if you go back to traditional Africa, you don't succeed alone. In fact, up to now, because I, out of eight children, I'm, I probably attended more school, traveled more, but what I have in me is not that I am a high achiever. What I have in me is that I saw, I stole my brother's and sister's luck. And therefore, I have an obligation to create conditions in which they can be as I have been privileged to be. So I see my position as a privilege rather than a deserved position. Circumstances conspired to allow me to have to do what I'm doing. I should now become an instrument to conspire for others to be like the little thing we are talking about. Um, Ayoton, I haven't even scratched your question, but if you have also insights on your very question, I would love to hear from you. Thanks, uh, thanks. You, you, yeah. Well, you expanded on the uh, on the concept of Ubuntu, and and yeah, it's it's just something that arose is uh, in the breakouts uh, where. I was so much explaining how Ubuntu yeah, really comes naturally to me, but at the same time, I can't reconcile with the other aspects of yeah, what I see really as like the failure of Ubuntu in the same yeah, society again. So yeah, th thanks for, for touching on that and really explaining, actually putting more meat onto what it means, uh, yeah and the background as well thanks 
Thank you for your question. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Um, next, Richard. Great, thank you so, so much. Um, Matilda and Angela and I, towards the end of our discussion, we started talking about uh, land ownership um, as obviously relates to power. And that hasn't been dealt with explicitly here today. And that seemed important. Land ownership and the, the laws that support that. We, we recognized and felt very passionately that there's been historical theft of land. And I would say, as a speaking as an Englishman, I'm very conscious of the, the theft of land that's really the colonization of land that started in, in England way back. It started in England and that, that land ownership and that uh, the legal and the financial systems that support that seems critical because if people don't have access to land in order to make the connections to heal, to build society, then that's a major obstacle. Uh, so perhaps that's something that needs to be acknowledged and, and thought about if indeed it, ha it hasn't been, perhaps you've already dealt with that. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for your insight. Thank you. Anyone else would like to share or has a question, Willem, you would like to answer? Yeah, I think just briefly, because Richard mm -hmm. is just uh, on the topic of land tenure. And uh, of course, this is a huge topic and a very difficult one. And uh, just when you were, when, uh, as we are working at a landscape level, we will face the issue of land tenure immediately, uh, the private land, the commons, and the public land. And um, um, only if you can create, and that's why the EU process is so important, if you can create a common vision for a landscape, you're able, and that's what we tried to do, you're able to um, identify what kind of land uses you want to have within that landscape. And that goes beyond land ownership because the land ownership and land tenure issues will remain there and you cannot immediately change that thanks to all those laws and, and policies that have been developed over hundreds of years or, or tens of years. But what you can do is that you can bring land, different type of land owners together and identify what is the common purpose of this land if it wants to serve us as human beings and the species living in that land for the coming decades and centuries. And from that perspective, you're able to help land different landowners to team up together in, for instance, creating ecological corridors through those public and private lands, um, facilitate the um, different side, yeah, the, the different ways of sustainable agriculture, forestry, and grazing systems to sustain that land and work together. So it is it is definitely not easy. Um, uh, so we recognize that, but bringing in a long-term commitment and long-term of financial commitment and talking about those risk and returns, you gradually move away from only land ownership towards a common land stewardship while still being those owners of that land. Uh, and that's why the zoning approach is very helpful to read a landscape. Uh, as we are talking about, uh, uh, I mean, at Commonland, we start to talk about the landscape if it is above 100,000 hectares. And 150,000 hectares is more or less the size of Luxembourg, to give you an example of how much that is. So it is, it's a big issue. And we, we will definitely not be able to avoid things like greenwashing, or, or, or stealing lands, all those things that are happening now everywhere, uh, but uh, only with a common vision for a future landscape perspective, you can overcome these issues. Thank you, William. Thank you very much. And just want to be mindful of our time together. So we have another five minutes uh, for uh, the questions. So if, there we go. Tobeka, go ahead. Great, thank you, thank you, Katie. Oh no, Florentia. 
Um, greetings from South Africa. I'm just um, piggybacking on what uh, Martin and my dear colleague there, Alton, I think something iPhone. Isn't that funny? I, f I remember that part, but not his first name. I'm so sorry. Um, you know, the whole thing of, well, with my colleague who were in our pair, what was interesting, a conversation was around how can we um, help people move what they know into action. So, you know, they know that there's these problems, they know that there's this issue, but then they get stuck there. And she's like a little frustrated. I was like, okay, but guys, we need to get this work done. Why are we still talking? Why aren't we just putting in action what we should be putting in action? So that was something interesting for me to think and, and, and process in my mind is as we go along this journey, who are the people we're working with and how are we working in the system that we inherited, that we are living in? And going back to the Ubuntu thing is like, when I know, when I say, I, when I preach Ubuntu with around my friends, they all look at me as if I'm crazy. Like, Tobega, where are you? Ubuntu doesn't exist anymore, right? But it's because the system we're in doesn't allow that characteristics of Ubuntu to flourish. The conditions don't allow it. And so, my brother, we are going to be always have to be fighting the normal system that we stuck in to do what's right, to remember what our forefathers brought in and helped us balance the world. Because Africa is part of the world and we have characteristics that we have put aside because the system, the, the colonization didn't allow that to happen. So now we that are aware, we're going to be fighting against, you know, as they give the example of the salmon fish, we're up, upstreaming so that we can do it. And then obviously the West, being the West, how awesome they are, they're going to take the thing and put it to a pedestal and talk about Ubuntu, where now suddenly I'm hearing about Ubuntu from Oxford University or from Harvard, as if it's a new phenomenon, but actually it came from us, but we left it, right? But we left it because the system didn't allow us to use it. And now that there's a mess up, they're like, hey, by the way, there's this thing called Ubuntu. And I'm like, yes, but we've known this. But my brothers and sisters, we've left it behind. So we need to take it on and take ownership of it. And it's going to be hard. And we're going to have our own family members looking at us, looking at us as if we're mad. I know that. I'm like, yeah, it's cool. We get there, you know, and that's just the process. But anyway, thank you. Oh, my God. I love your energy. This is incredible. Thank you so much for coming in. This is amazing. I don't know if someone wants to, to come in. Thank you so much, really. Dieter, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I, I know Tobek and we've been in a, a few digital spaces together and I met her as well when I was in South Africa and I agree that the energy and the input and the wisdom she brings is always really refreshing, but as well challenging the system. That, so Tobek, thanks again for your input here. Um, I can't talk about what you were talking about, Ubuntu, the rest, that's not my place to talk about, but, but I really, well, while you were in the uh, little groups and what you were saying to Becca, for me, it's like the, the challenge of us as change maker will be on the one side to open our hearts and be compassionate to those people and invite them in, even when we know their history or what, where they come from or what they were doing. But that's why what you said to Becca, to, they have the courage to stay strong with where we come from in the spirit and how do you balance those two? I think that's a, a great challenge. And I think for me, it's another one is like, how can we change the terminology we use in this work? Because we still use the word fighting or against or that kind of wording and how can we shift that? And I think a lot, I come from a conservation world uh, and uh, an activism world uh, and, We've been really using kind of the methodology and the language to talk other people in a bat. You are wrong. When you don't change, the world will disappear. So it's always, it's like the normal marketing 
uh, like what Coca-Cola does, let you feel bad. And when you buy my product, you will feel good. That's what we've been using as well, in, I think, in the change world. I think when we can change that again to inspire people to who they are, but as well from an abundance and, and engage with that in, in an invitation, not trying to hit people with a stick, but say, hey, come and join us, make small steps with us. We can do this together. You know, like I think that will really help shift people's. And what you said, Tobeke, when you talk with people and they think you're crazy, great. Then there is another space to explain it the second time. And then we need to create spaces for us to hold each other in that. So I think that's really important. But again, thanks, Tobeke. Thanks, Dieter. So I just really want to be mindful of our time. And I would like to just ask if there is one of you in the guests that would like to have just a few last uh, comments before we hand it over to Peter for the closing. Thank you everyone Thank for you your questions. Question. The, the only thing I, I wanted to add was just that I recognize that so many people um, on this call are actually doing amazing work on exactly these topics. So I hope that we have another call that really brings in all of these different stories, because what I feel here is this global movement um, and we're creating change. And I heard stories today that I had no idea about. So this just gives me a lot of hope. Um, and thank you for all showing up and listening to us. And I really look, look forward to listening to all of you as well. Thank you, Katie. And Aleki, I feel so bad because I obviously see you, huh? but... <laughs> Do you have like a quick question maybe or like a statement? Uh, just maybe just leave you with the image that is in my mind that in a lot of spiritual traditions, whether it's Buddhism or, or here in Europe or elsewhere, you have this image of a leader who in one hand holds justice or compassion or righteousness and in the other hand holds a sword or fury or anger and i think it's very important that it's i agree with what was just said to uh give people to not use the coca-cola strategy to to make people want to come with us uh so you're taking them by the hand but in the other hand you have the threat still you have the anger you have the trauma you have you have the urgency to move and not just to talk about things because I also really feel this, this frustration about all the talking. Thank you, Aleki, for coming in. You were meant to be there. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Peter, your turn uh, for the closing and thank you so much everyone for the really amazing and richness uh, conversation. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much also to you, Florentina, for hosting us in uh, in the various dialogues and bringing sort of weaving the threads together um, uh, between all of the breakout sessions and allowing us to tap into some of the stories that Katie was referring to. Um, I know there's so many more, and I also see that the chat is sort of um, uh, buzzing away here in the corner of my screen with lots of little stories and insights and questions. I wish to continue the conversation. Um, and uh, I wish to bring to service more of the insights. And um, it is very much our intention that uh, the thought paper that we call Creating Spaces of Belonging um, is an ongoing conversation. Sometimes documents give the impression that they are finished, but for us, it's, it's our current image of the insights we have, and we would like to launch it with all of you um, as an invitation for a further conversation uh, around what it means to create spaces of belonging, to bring healing to people and places, uh, to soul and soil. Um, and therefore, we will uh, send you the document really as an invitation to reach out to us, uh, to contribute with your thoughts and reflections, um, and to let us know uh, how it's landing with you and what you're learning on your path. Um, so we will, just on the practical uh, side of things, we will now put a, a direct link uh, for you, those of you that are eager uh, to the document uh, in the chat. Uh, so I will do that right now, then, uh, then that's off and the suspense uh, can come to an end. Um, but we will also follow up to everyone who registered uh, to the event with an email uh, with a link as well. So if you do not 
uh, manage to, to download it from the chat. Uh, you will receive it afterwards and we will also publish it next week um, on our website as a news article. Um, and again, uh, we very much see it as a, an ongoing and continuing conversation. Um, and just as I'm closing this session, uh, I would like to speak gratitude to all of the speakers, Martin, Willem, Dieter and Katie, um, to Florentina for co-hosting with me and for all of our fellow colleagues at the Presidency Institute, um, Common Land and um, all of our landscape partners across the globe and all of you audience um, for joining this session and contributing your thoughts. Um, and I cannot close without thinking one other person and she is a little bit hidden in the background, um, but there's someone amongst us called Micah Baumanns who has been able to draw all of these sort of vague notions and insights together into the language, the actual words that have uh, shown up in this thought paper. Um, and uh, I just want to speak the last words of gratitude to Micah for bringing her artistry uh, and her creativity and her thoughtfulness into all of the words um, that have made this document for what it is. So thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you, Micah for putting words on paper. Uh, and I wish all of you the most wonderful rest of your morning, afternoon and evening. Um, and I welcome you to unmute and say goodbye um, in whatever words you prefer. Thanks again. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Salamat. Salamat. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Mike, you blaf you out, okay, Eva? Take Uh, Mohammed. Yeah, yeah, Martin, thank you. Really, I love your session and to everyone to Florida and let's see. All right, so um, we're just gonna uh, do a little debrief and reflection with the speaker. So um, I'd like to thank you, Christine, also for joining us. And um, yeah, take this moment to also say thank you for joining and have a wonderful rest of your day. And then I think it's just us left here. Bye, Christine. Thanks, Christine. Yay!